Hey guys, so as promised, I interviewed Christine Jacobson this past weekend. She's the author of the book, Dancing Around the Truth. It's her story about how she discovered her African ancestry after being raised as a white woman. I'm excited about sharing this interview with you and I hope you enjoy the video. Okay, great. So how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. I'm glad to meet you. I loved your book. See, I have it here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm finding so many things out about myself. And now we're on this journey to find out more about my husband's family. He thought he knew things. And like you, he really didn't and it's a lot of family secrets there so hopefully we'll be as um you know successful as you've been on our journey but along the way too i want to hear about other people's stories so you're my very first person i've interviewed outside my family to talk about your right. dna journey so okay good, good. <laughs> i'm glad and I'm Thank really happy you that you're doing a YouTube channel about DNA testing and, and how candid you are talking about your own journey mm -hmm. and your husband's journey. I think it's really important. You know, I just knew that I had to write the book so that I could try to make sense out of this overwhelming amount of information that I was getting through Ancestry.com mainly, and, but also through 23andMe. So I tested with both of them and then just joining the community of people that had a misattributed parentage event or a not parent expected event. This is the NPE is, is a, a little acronym that uh, people use to describe those of us that found out, for example, that our father wasn't our father or that we were donor conceived or people most people knew they were adopted but maybe didn't know the family lineage so it's it's wonderful to have a forum to be able to talk about these things because the information is so overwhelming at first and i think your friends and sometimes even your family get tired of hearing you talk about it they just don't yeah. understand <laughs> absolutely how meaningful it is to you right so where I want to start, though, because I know in the book you mentioned that I think at least one person had some suspicions as to your identity and your African-American background. And uh, one thing I know about the Black community is normally Black people can identify when other people have, you know, some African in them. It's not always the case, but normally it is the case. When I was looking at your pictures, and there's a, on page 48, there's a picture of you and your mother, and I think you were just a baby. It always says you were one. I'm yeah. looking at that picture, and I'm thinking, for sure, you look like a, a child of mixed race ancestry. Right. So, <laughs> and so... To me, especially, I'm seeing the difference between your mother's skin tone and and you. And I'm thinking there wouldn't be any doubt, at least from any person I know, that you had a mixed race ancestry. So it's surprising to me that for so many years, no one picked up on that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I ever photographed that way again. Like I have a whole big scrapbook and, and I never, and I, lots of pictures where I'm hugging my mother and so on. And I yeah. never really looked quite that dark again, except later on when I would actually spend time in the Caribbean and tan and, you know, I could do that. Or if I'm at the end of the summer, you know, maybe my skin is tan. Sometimes in the winter, some people would say to me, Oh, you, were you out in the sun? Your skin's tan, right. you know, mm -hmm. but um, no, really nobody ever did until I uh, dated somebody in the Caribbean in, in Guadeloupe and his mother who was not African based or, you know, a person of color, she noticed it. 
Yeah. Why do you think she picked up on it? It was the culture like really diverse in that area for her yes. to have. Yeah. Okay. Guadeloupe in the French West Indies is, you know, definitely one of the Caribbean nations that, uh, well, they didn't achieve independence, but they certainly had a lot of uh, Africans there and there are a lot of people of color and um, her and her family, they were white from Lebanon. They were Lebanese based. And I think that they were very worried. They had one son who was already dating a woman of color there. Oh, okay. They were I got worried you. about it. Yeah. There was a picture on page 56 of you and your dad. Uh, the, the dad who raised you and I'm thinking wow I, I could really tell in that picture too you know but it's just like that sometimes you know people don't know so or they don't want to know right they don't want to know they overlook it right here's the big difference between like our situations like for me I'm 75 percent African and 25 percent European and you're like reverse, right? You're like, uh, I think you're over a little bit over 20% African. And it's funny because in America, no one will look at me and say, I can call myself European or white or whatever. You know, I'm nothing but black in America. I never knew that so many people felt a certain way about my mixed ancestry because I've gotten so many comments now on YouTube about, well, you shouldn't call yourself black. You should call yourself mixed race because that's who you are. And so the question becomes, okay, at what percentage um, should someone have, like, what's the cutoff, right? Like how much African or how much European do you have to have to be considered mixed race or black? or white, or I'm getting to a point now on my journey, does it even matter? Hey, even in my house, like my husband has over 40% European ancestry. He didn't know it, but he does. So now people who hear his story, they want to say, well, he's not black. He's mixed race, (laughs) you know? And I'm like, okay, so he was black for over 40 years of his life. And now he's not. So if I don't know if you feel the same way too, but it becomes questions like that. You know, people have so many strong beliefs about what should be considered black, what should be considered white, and what should be considered mixed race. And I know that um, even from reading your book, your views have I should say, I don't know, maybe they have changed. I don't know. You can speak about that. I don't want to put words there, but share a little bit about that. You know, do you think you have changed from where you started to where you are now? Uh, What type of experiences have you had with people seeing you or classifying you either as white or black now that they know that you're mixed race? Well, I'm so glad you brought this up because Trish, I got to tell you, that you started off saying, you know, if you're if you have a white parent, a European parent, and an African American parent, then you are mixed race. In my case, much like President Obama, he had a white European mother and an African father, but he's black. Mm-hmm. But I'm white, right? So it was. A, Really, it was very confusing for me in the beginning. Very confusing. So uh, my identity was really broken up into so many pieces. Here I've lived my entire life as a white woman with maybe just hints of maybe I had some African ancestry, but I didn't know until I did the DNA test at age 65. What I started to learn, I, I just did this deep dive into what is mixed race? How do mixed race people feel? What is um, what is an African American go through, mm-hmm. and, and how many African American authors can I read talking about race, both contemporary and um, like Baldwin and, and Zora Neale Thurston? I just dove in trying to understand this new part of my identity that I had never known before, and at the right. same time 
totally understand that race is overall a, a, a social construct. You know, it's mm-hmm. not biologically true. It doesn't make any sense at all from a biological standpoint. So, but yet, you know, I still struggled with wanting to embrace African American culture, wanting to be accepted by African Americans making mistakes along the way, right? Um, yeah. maybe misappropriating certain cultural norms that I never was part of. And, and I did finally have to accept that you know, I was raised a white woman and I've lived my life that way. I've never had the African-American experiences or even mm-hmm. the, the Caribbean American experiences. Right. I've never even had experiences of a, of a mixed race person. Yes. So I, I had to really let that go. But in, in all that searching, it helped me to understand also what it means to be white and, and mm-hmm. what are the, um, the consequences that white people face as a result of this racism that's been such a heavy part of our culture for 400 years. And right. So there were there were a lot. There was a lot that I went through and that I'm still going through. I don't feel like I've finished learning as much as I can about how specifically how racism lives inside my body. I think that was the hardest thing for right. me to, to accept was that, um, wow, you know, I have like this internalized racism and I thought I was one of the good white people. You know, I thought that was, that's who I am. And I'm come to learn that, you know, I'm just, just as fallible and flawed as um, many, many other white people paradigm. I thought that was so insightful, you know, and the fact that you're open enough to even discuss it, because it really speaks a lot to where you are on your journey, because it takes a lot of self reflection to really recognize that those things are in you. And to just to be open with people and share it, you know, we all have our biases, right? Because I discovered actually that my dad's um, haplogroup is not even African. It goes back to Ireland. His paternal lineage started in Ireland. It takes some, you know, really getting used to it because you, you start this journey thinking you're one thing. And then along the way, you get a lot of discoveries and realize, okay, there are many different pieces to the puzzle, right? There was a story in the book about how you kind of found out by accident about your identity, and then it just became hush-hush for a while. But looking back now, because they say hindsight is twenty twenty, do you think your mom dropped any other clues along the way before that day when her friend just came out and told you that you're really biracial? Do you think maybe, did she ever give you any other type of hints as you were growing up? No. Not that you were aware of. Okay. Not that I was aware of. And, you know, I've recently been thinking about her um, and thinking about pre- in relation to pregnancy, because I'm, I'm, I'm part of an anti-racism group and we're reading my grandmother's hands. Oh, okay. Which is wonderful. And we're doing the, the somatic work in, from that book. And we're, we're on chapter three and it's where you call your ancestors. And one of the questions for contemplation is, you know, what was the experience of your mother's pregnancy? And I think I wrote some of that in the book, which I think she, I imagine that she questioned how the baby would look when I was born, how I would look when I was born. And that, that has come up in, in regards to, so my mother had trauma, her father died That's when I was, she was six months pregnant with me. And then right after that, she had to have an appendectomy, which in 1952, when you're six months pregnant, pretty serious. So she had trauma and I had trauma when I gave birth to my son. And I remember that she was alive at that time. And 
she never really said, oh, I'm going to be there. I want to be there for when you have your baby. I think most mothers kind of want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that even then, there was some anxiety on her part mm. to not like, how is her grandchild going to right. reveal her yeah. be revealed because maybe the grandchild turns out much darker because my husband's Italian. So, right. Um, yeah, he's European. So yeah, I don't know if that was why she maybe hesitated to be with me. So there were no clues prior to that when she told me when I was 16 and there were no clues after that either. She oh never my. talked about it and I never asked her. She never brought it up and I never asked her. So that's very interesting because, you know, it could happen based upon DNA and because we were shocked when my youngest daughter came out with red hair and we were like, okay, where did the red exactly. hair come from? You know? Right. And it's funny because my father's, brother had daughters with red hair but his wife was white so we always thought well they have red hair because his wife is white yeah. you never know what you're going to get in, right. in families when there's mixed ancestry now i know that your parents who raised you were you mentioned in the book they were pretty liberal did you have any were there any like black family friends or did you have any little black friends growing up that maybe could have said, okay, Christine, there's something different about Christine, you know, because <laughs> uh, I know you mentioned that you were a great dancer and, you know, and you love certain types of music. Did you ever have that type of friendship where they looked at you and said, okay, I know Christine, you must have something there. I didn't growing up. No, but my parents did. I mean, they were very liberal and I think, what I've come to learn about there, they always had African-American friends come to the house. And my father had spent four or five months in Africa working on, um, on a commercial. And he brought back a lot of African artifacts and they always loved you know, Count Basie and Duke Ellington. And they loved black people, but it was in a kind of a, a fetish way is the way mm -hmm. that I realize it now. You know, they, mm -hmm. they idolize them and, mm -hmm. and not, you know, not in a good way. I don't right. think so. Uh, just looking at like their particular brand of racism. But I right. did have, you know, we, we lived in a very white Anglo-Saxon neighborhood and I was looking at recent school pictures. I didn't have an, a black person in my class until I was in, junior high school so wow. yeah so I didn't have that but as I got older <laughs> people would say to me oh, are you like Spanish or with my husband they would say oh you must be Italian somebody said to me once yeah I see a little bit of Puerto Rican in you you know one thing I thought was really interesting I love this kind of stuff too the fact that you're uh, you were a dancer and your father and his father were dancers and entertainers. I, I'm really interested in that stuff because I'm going to be doing a video coming up talking about the nurture versus nature type of stuff and our talents and whether or not they're inherited or if maybe they're taught to us. And I know in the book you questioned you know, if it was the environment you were raised in, because I know your, you mentioned your father was in the entertainment business. Right, right. Or if it perhaps was just in your genes, I'm leaning towards <laughs> that. You, it probably was a little bit of both, right? But the fact that, you know, you followed into dance and your dad and your grandfather both did that. What are your thoughts on that? Like, do you think that's something you inherited from them? I struggled with this part a lot, uh, the nature versus nurture. And for the longest time, I thought it was that I inherited it. Even though my son said to me, mom, there's no dance gene. That's just another way of me being racist. You know, <laughs> <telling me. laughs> So I was like, oh, okay, I have to let that go. Um, 
but I just couldn't really shake this, the I irony of the fact that my biological father was a dancer and that my grandparents were dancers, that they were on Broadway on the same street that I wound up mm -hmm. being on a half a century later. And um, it just, it just seemed too unbelievable to say right. that that had been nurtured because I mean, yeah, my mother took me to ballet classes when I was young, but neither her nor my father were gifted in that department at mm -hmm. all. They weren't musically inclined or, or you know, never danced, um, didn't move their body in certain ways. Um, so, and, and I researched epigenetics Mm -hmm. which is the science of certain things being passed down through your DNA from multiple generations. And I felt that perhaps the science on epigenetics is not a hundred percent statistically relevant yet. So I started to let that go. And then I started to look at the, the nurture part of my upbringing and how my parents having idolized black people for so long kind of set me up to do that as well as I got older. So my first mm -hmm. husband was a biracial man from Brazil. And I always, anytime I went to a dance class, it, I always had to have an African-American teacher. I never liked studying with white teachers. Mm -hmm. I only wanted to be around the drums and the bare feet and you know, there was just something about Africa and the Caribbean that kept pulling me. Right. That just kept pulling at my soul. So I don't really have an answer yet about um, did, did that pulling, that feeling at the soul, is that nurture? Can that be nurtured in you? So I think you're right. I think it is a little bit of both. I think is definitely a little bit of both, but... Just from my experience, I, think, I don't think we can deny the fact that certain talents and things run in families, right? I was just having, I did a video recently with my oldest son, and he's in his 20s. And we were talking about this because he didn't grow up with his father. But I said, it's funny because you walk just like him. You talk just like him. You are interested in things that he likes, but he's never lived with them, right? So, and that's what started started us on that conversation or, you know, wanting to do a video on whether or not we are who we are through DNA or if it's something that, you know, I think it, it's just too many coincidences just to say, oh, no, we're just taught those things. I really, and actually... I do think dance is in your genes, actually. You know, I didn't inherit it, but, you know, I wish I did. <laughs> but I do see where whole families can, you know, dance and do things. And I'm leaning towards that you did inherit it from your father and your grandfather. And it makes a great um, story and connection, right? Do you feel like that gives you a special connection to them, maybe? Yeah. I mean, I definitely feel and have felt very connected to them through that and uh, through their story of how they came to be dancers and traveled all over the world dancing. I had a very successful career. And I only wish that they had had um, like a transition program like I had. Right. When you get too old to be a dancer, you know, what's the yeah. next thing that you're going right. to do? Right. Absolutely. I don't think they had that opportunity and they both struggled with that. It, yeah, I do feel a very special connection to them. In the book, you talk about your son's reactions, you know, before you found out for sure you were mixed race. And then after, you know, he felt like maybe you shouldn't dress in African clothing or different stuff like that. I'm just curious, how has he accepted it now that you know for sure you're mixed race and what's his take on it now after, since he's had some time to really, you know, think about it, get used to the idea and all of that. 
Um, I think he feels the same way. You know, we, we haven't really discussed it. He knows what I'm doing um, in terms of the work on anti-racism. We, we talk about that. He feels that unfortunately he doesn't think racism is going to be eradicated in my lifetime in this country. Um, but he really, he hasn't really changed his view. I'm white and there's just no way around it. Right. Does he have any children yet? <laughs> no. Okay. I was just wondering if he feels the responsibility to teach his children about their African American or African roots, because I know you have Caribbean roots as well. Yeah. Yeah. And actually I told him the other day, I, ancestry I hadn't been on it in about a year and they had reconfigured my ethnicity estimates. And originally I thought I was like 17% um, Nigerian. And now it's, uh, mostly Western Bantu people, mm -hmm. Cameroon, and he's only 1% Nigerian. So he's got a really good friend who's Nigerian. He just actually was with him the other night. And he said to me, oh boy, when I'm going to tell my friend that I'm only 1% Nigerian, he's really <laughs> upset. <laughs> so yeah. he, um, does he feel a responsibility? Uh, I'm not sure. I think he's more about who you're raised by is the most important thing. He's more about the nurture. Than the okay. Nature. Yeah. So at the end of the book, you had a statement in there that I thought was very interesting. And maybe your views have changed since the book has come out, but you mentioned on page 81 you said, this is going to sound crazy because it makes no sense. And I don't feel I have a right to, but I, I identify as black. Can you, first of all, is that something you still feel? Because I know, you know, we all change in life. And sometimes, you know, along our journeys, we might change our views on things. So I'm just curious as to if that's something you still feel. And if you can just talk to us about it a little bit it, it's very hard yeah it was when I told that to that reporter it was how I feel in my soul and and the other thing that I said along with that was just that all of a sudden I recognized how people in the LGBT community that struggle with their identity how they feel that they just have some kind of an inner knowing that doesn't maybe match with what goes on in society, mm -hmm. how they present to the world. I've felt that way. I've had that longing, as I said, you know, for such a long time and that I always felt so comfortable and, and that I was with my, my people, my tribe, whenever I'm with Africans or African Americans or Caribbean Americans or Caribbean people or in Brazil, I've always felt very, very comfortable around mixed and, and people of color. So I do feel like that's my home and that that's my inner nature. But it, according to the structures of society, I have to accept that I'm white. I've had the white experience. I haven't had the African American experience. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing I can do about that. So I do still feel that in my heart. Yeah, and it's okay. I, I totally feel like you have a right to because that's part of who you are, right? I mean, I'm personally not one of those who say, oh, you have to be how you look or how you present or, you know. And I know some people are like that because it's interesting I don't know if you saw this on my channel, but I had um, posted about doing an interview with you. And one of my viewers replied and said, he was a black man. And he said, and he's younger probably. Um, he said, well, she rightfully should identify herself as white because that's who she is. That's how she looks and that's who she is. And 
so he and I had a, we went back and forth on that for a while because I, one of the things I replied back to him is, you know, I grew up in the black community, so I don't say that I should speak for all black people, but I do know that if you denied your African heritage, heritage you received from your father, several people in the black community would have a problem with that, right? Because they would feel like you were denying your African roots. So it's kind of like one of those things you can't win for losing, right? Because exactly. if you say, okay, I, I, I'm recognizing and declaring that I'm part black and I'm proudly so because I know my father, my birth father, you know, he has African roots. And then there's always going to be some people who say, well, no, you don't have a right to say that, you know, you're black because you don't look black. And I'm not for that, right? I'm all for it. Hey, obviously she has African roots because that's who her father was, right? And I don't think any one person or a group of people should be gatekeepers of what should be black and what should not be black. Right. Because my response back to him was whenever that's the case, you're always going to um, exclude people. It's funny because even though I'm 75% African, some black people don't think that's black enough for me to go around calling myself black. So I, my oh my question God. back, to them is always what percentage is enough right right and and if you say okay it's 90 percent, okay if it's 90 percent, and my child is 88 percent, so my child has to be mixed race and i'm black you know it just becomes complicated <laughs> extremely you yeah, know so I, mean, I, I looked into like jefferson's mathematical equ equation for, for uh, mulatto, uh -huh. and it's it's crazy. You know, he's got a whole A equals black and B equals white or whatever, and C, you know, A plus B equals C. Now that's one quarter. So he had this whole breakdown of how people became quarterooms, right? Or quadrooms. Yeah, you should look it up. It's fascinating. Jefferson, the, you know, the biggest contradiction in terms of racism and this country and talking about freedom and then having slaves and, and fathering children and so on. So there was that. And the other thing I wanted to say though is one thing that my son was very worried about was that I would be going Rachel Dolezal. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was like his big fear. Oh mom, you're not going to go all Rachel Dolezal, you know, with the, the braids and everything. And, you know, it's not fair for him to say that because she does not have an ounce of African blood in her, you know. <laughs> the person I'm speaking about who replied to my uh, YouTube post, he mentioned Rachel and he yeah. he tried to compare you to her. And I said, and I, my response wow. back to him was that very thing. Well, it's not the same because she did not have African ancestry. This is different. I said she was pretending to be something that she legitimately was not or is not. Whereas Christine obviously has those roots. So I don't see how you can compare the two when you obviously came from African ancestry and she did not. But I went on to say, even though Rachel didn't, I have a problem with people um, saying, okay, they can't assist in the cause or they can't fight racism because they're not black. I feel like if they're helping the cause and not hurting it, what's the big deal, right? Regardless of what race you are, you know, the only problem I would have if she was trying to do anything for her own personal gain, which I don't know if that was the case or not, she would, she would be the only one to know that. But, you know, that's that whole colorism thing within the Black community, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, and it's been going on for centuries. Yeah. And, and 
it's because, you know, you're never going to be black enough or you're going to be too light skinned or whatever. It's just something that should be done away with, I think, you know. In the book, I know you went back to your grandfather, but have you done any digging beyond that, like back further from your grandfather? Have you traced your ancestry back more than just your grandfather? Like, do you know some of your other ancestors? My great grandfather. So I don't know why they named everybody Paul. So my biological father was Paul Mears Jr. My biological grandfather was Paul Mears Sr. His father was Paul Aitken Mears. Oh, goodness. (laughs) And he was from Cornwall, England. He was the white man. Now, my paternal great-grandmother was a Black woman that uh, they believe she had she was very, very tall, so they thought she had more of that Eastern African ancestry in her. I can't find any information on her. And that's, you know, very disappointing. I might be able to somewhere in London, maybe they tell me. Uh, most likely I wouldn't find anything in the Bahamas. The record keeping is very, very bad there. So I'm not really sure if she was, I know she worked on the Sissel farm that my great grandfather worked on. And I know that my great great grandfather was Charles Edwin Mears, who was the rector of the church in Nassau in the Bahamas. And he disavowed his biracial children. He never oh, had anything to do with wow. them. Do, okay, so I don't know. Um, because it, and it didn't say in the book, but were you able or to trace your ancestry back to slavery? So do you have any information on that? No, unfortunately. I mean, that's something that I really wondered about with uh, Victoria. That was my great, great grandmother. I wondered um, what was her relationship like with Paul right. eight years, you know, was yeah. she his worker. And she had three children by him and then he later married somebody Um, so I don't know yeah see I don't know really um what was their relationship was it truly consensual uh or was it you know non-consensual was it so are you still doing digging are you still on your discovery journey or are you done are you content with the information you have now I, I have been content for a year. After I published the book, it helped settle me down. After I had got through writing it, it helped to like really clarify things for me in my own head about how I felt about my identity and about race. And I've continued to work on that path of learning more about anti-racism and, and where I might fit in with that conversation. I do have a sibling in, in Europe that I would like to find. Wow. That I don't think I'll be able to find. Okay. I've still never met my first cousin who kind of. Oh, you still haven't daughters. met her. But we talk on the phone and she's got a lot of information and she shares it with me. And, and you know, those things like when you said how your son walks, moves and talks like his biological father. Those mm-hmm. kind of details when you have known about your heritage are just so important. Right. And she has that. I, I'll maybe send a picture to her of myself and say, oh, look at this in profile. I look just like my biological father. And she'll agree with me. And so it's, it's, she's a very important person in my life, but I still would love to meet her. But I guess she's right. not interested in meeting me. Now, Do you wish that your childhood would have been different? Do you wish that your mother would have told you or maybe if she would have always been open with you? And do you wish you would have known your father from the time you were a little girl, your birth father? I do. Yeah. I wish my mother had been honest with me. I wish I had had access to my paternal family and their customs and their ways of being. And just, if I could have been a part of that, 
uh, I'm very grateful for the life that I had. I, I, you know, my father that raised me gave me everything and, and he was such a good dad and I love him. But um, I would have liked to have had that experience to, to know my biological father. I don't think that I would have been, I couldn't have been left with him. I, he had no desire really to be a father. Mm -hmm. I don't think support any of his children in, in any way, shape or form. Did he know about you at all? He didn't know about me, no. Okay. So true. I very much appreciate you so much. I really love this book. Do you think there will be a part two? Or <laughs> Maybe. I'm just curious, you know? Uh, and I have to say this, Christine, because you look amazing. Did you just tell me that you took the test at 65? Yes. All right. Yes. When I tell you that there's no way you could even be 65 now. I mean, oh, thank you. You look <laughs> incredible. Oh Thanks. my gosh. You obviously have wonderful genes, you know? Well, yeah, I know. And you know, that stupid saying that everybody says. Yeah. Well, in, in your case, it's working for you because, <laughs> and I appreciate you telling your story. It's an amazing story. I'm going to encourage all my viewers to go out. Some of them have already read it actually. And I think not only, you know, I'm sure it helped you to tell it, but it helps other people because it provides so much insight into race, you know, things that people don't really want to talk about. But I think the way you wrote it, it gives people a comfortable look into it. You know, it allows them to really address their own, maybe their own personal racism and the way they view the world without being offended i think so i think it's a very good book i encourage everyone to go out and read it so it's just so validating to have you tell me that you know i can be part of the conversation or maybe help start a conversation That's you absolutely can and you need to we have to start talking about things like this and just being open about it and i just thank you for being courageous enough to do that and for sharing your journey with us Congratulations on your great YouTube channel. And uh, oh, it's just a joy. And I, I agree with you. God has a way of bringing us together. And yeah, definitely.